get this show because we're running live. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm going to call the meeting to order at 5 o'clock. And uh, Brian has graciously volunteered to take the notes tonight and call the roll. <laughs> so, uh, voluntold, I guess. Um, so, Brian, could you please call the roll for the school building committee? Sure. Uh, Danielle DeSimone? Here. Hey. You going to make me do it? Manson? Nope, here. Okay. Andy. Here. Okay. <laughs> Brian Mahoney? Uh, Brian said he's potentially coming late. He okay. had something to take care of. Uh, James, James Manny? Yeah. Chip McGar? Chip said he could not make it. Okay. This is lame. Uh, Mark okay. Prince? David Pal Palazzetti? Aye. I am here. Luke Murray? Here. Good. All right. We do have a quorum. Um, we'll move on to approval of meeting minutes. And, and just to start, uh, so the Recreation Commission, as the members of the Recreation Commission, welcome, have joined us. What I'll do is when I get to the agenda item that we're going to be presenting, you can convene. And that way, you'll be part of the meeting um, officially. And then, uh, and then you can certainly adjourn after that topic item. If you want to stay, you're welcome to, but don't feel obligated. So I'll move on to approval of meeting minutes. I have not received anything from the school department. I would express, and I will express to the school department, these are languishing. So I need to get meeting minutes. So I guess I'll ask the members who are here from the school um, to take that message back. And I will also um, put that out. Um, guarantee that two of them are done because I did them myself. Right. Um, they are, they've been submitted to Crystal. She's filling in the rest and they'll be handed out for the next meeting. Perfect. All right. So, you, you know, if we can get caught up, that would be great. i um, move on to new business items. So the chairperson's report first, I'd like to identify that Brian is now a full member of the committee. He was sworn in today. Welcome, Brian. And thank you for doing the meeting minutes. It's always a loveless task, so we do appreciate it. But I think having Brian on this will be beneficial. He's already run a lot of the numbers in the background, as you all know. I think it'll be a great resource moving forward. So, um, and he, he uh, happy to be here, right, Brian? All right. <laughs> um, I did get a report out. I wanted to share with the, the committee. So there was. Um, uh, on Tuesday, the House Finance Committee met um, up at the State House to hear the legislation on the bond. Um, Michael, uh, Councilman Marin did attend, and he just gave a report out that he did testify that it was held for further study, which is not uncommon at this point in time. They usually hold until June on most legislation and kind of clear the decks in June. So all indicators are that there will not be any pushback. Um, like I said, I just want to reiterate that health affairs study doesn't mean it's dead. It just means it's in pending status with the committee. These things get advanced pretty quickly. I don't expect any pushback. Um, if I get more updates, I will let you know, but all indicators are we should expect that that will get passed. If I hear something different, I will, I will advise. Any questions on that? Okay, moving on. Um, just to let everyone know, I've had regular communications with Phil. We've talked about, you know, moving forward, the fact that the committee reiterating the fact that the committee at the last meeting had voted to move cost estimating forward. I encouraged him to do so. Um, he's got some additional concepts tonight of the building. So um, after we get to the CCMS athletic facility, um, we'll be looking at that and also uh, some green building design options or alternatives, I guess, for moving forward. So Phil will go over that. Um, also, the website has been updated. I did put on the la latest correspondence. Dave, did you finally get into that? Okay. So it's up. And then um, also the latest presentation documents. Uh, we're, we were behind a couple, so I did upload the slide decks for the last few meetings. So those are up for the benefit of the building committee and the public if they want to take a look. Um, and also the videos are also available. Any questions, comments on that? All right, so then we will move on to uh, discussion of public correspondence. Did everyone have a chance to take a look at the correspondence? Hopefully. Um, most of it was with regard, you know, quite a bit from Mr. Beasley regarding uh, sustainable building design and green design, which we'll touch upon tonight. Um, there were some links in there to, to some resources, so you'll, you'll likely want to take a look at that. Um, some good comments. Uh, there was a comment about the auditorium maintaining the 
current capacity, which is larger than what ride will typically allow. Um, so take a look if anything, you know, sparks for next meeting and you want to bring it up, certainly do so. Any questions on that? Comments? All right, then we'll move on. Um, so now we'll entertain the joint meeting work session with the South Kingstown Recreation Commission. I want to thank the commission for joining us tonight. I thought it was really important that you have a seat at the table and take a look and provide comment on this. So we're kind of moving forward together. Um, the idea is that we're in, in lockstep. So you certainly call the meeting to order for you since this is a posted meeting for both of us. So you want to you usually call a roll or? Yeah. So um, in calling the rec recreation uh, work session to order here um, from the rec commission we have. So Dave, what are, you, are you here for both or? <laughs> Here. We have Dave Falzetti, uh, Sean Johnson, Joanne Blessing, uh, Will Litvin, and myself, John Viafor. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'll ask Phil to come up. He's going to, so just the format, I asked Phil to present out what options he's created to date. Um, just to update the Recreation Commission members. Um, we've been working towards an option at Columbia and School Street for the building. But obviously on that site, because the field's restricted, we're looking at, and I, I brought this to the Recreation Commission, I believe last month, time escapes me, right? Um, that the proposal currently is to swap the existing hazard field to where the building currently exists, and then to build a new high school facility on the field. So that has, is materializing in concept. In addition to that, we're looking at an athletic facility. And we've, uh, identified the most probable and, and possible solution be at CCMS site. It's raising the building and putting an athletic facility in a more appropriate manner on that site. Currently, it's literally half in wetlands area. It would be pulled completely out of the wetlands, as Phil will show, and moved upland. The question comes into orientation, parking, what does that look like, and what does it also mean for future facilities? So this is where you're critical in, in the planning stages is also master planning because that is a recreation facility. So we're interested in your input. Um, are you good to go? You plugged mm -hmm. in? Okay. Does anybody, before I begin, uh, have in, any questions on that from the Recreation Commission or other? Okay, get you going. And there you go. Excellent. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Philip Conte. I'm an architect and president of Studio Jade, and we are the architecture and engineering firm that's working with South Kingstown and moving their ride stage two forward. So what we've developed are a couple site plans and a couple renderings for you to see uh, the amenities that we would be able to provide at the Curtis Corner Middle School site. We'll go ahead and start with this first one. So uh, in the next round of iterations, we will identify where the wetland buffer line is. But we wanted you to see how much real estate an eight lane track uh, and a field that for both soccer and football with visitor and home bleachers, as well as parking, tennis courts, pickleball courts, for example, here, uh, take up in that site. We did want to orient the stadium in the north-south direction, which is why we have identified the orientation on the plan. Uh, you can see in this concept, the parking is to the right off of Curtis Corner. We have a visitor side and a home side. We also have identified in the bottom portion of the site a future field house option. We think that would be an ideal uh, location for a structure. Certainly it could go elsewhere, but we wanted to make sure we identified a future placeholder. That field house is not part of this current plan. That's really a future master plan component. Um, you know, we identified three tennis courts, three pickleball courts, 
Uh, we got to be mindful. This is where we start getting into the wetlands at the uh, northern part of the site. This plan makes an assumption in that the current central office is not located on this particular site. Um, we're going to go ahead and look at a second option that does keep that building there. This is just a bird's eye view of the stadium. Certainly there's a lot more planning that would need to go into the field house, how people approach the stadium, et cetera. But we believe this is a good first start. Yes. Sure. So currently your stadium is right here where my cursor is. It does go into the wetlands area. It's right here where the future tennis courts would be. The school is basically uh, all of this area. And again, I, in, the, in the next round, we will go ahead and outline the existing school so people understand where it is, uh, as well as that wetlands line. But as you see, uh, a, an eight lane track with the appropriate size fields is, is large. And it fits very nicely into this site, by the way. Um, your orientation is proper. You have uh, as much parking as we could manage to fit in here. And again, this is very preliminary. We have just completed our, our survey of the site, so we're gonna be able to be far more accurate than what we're demonstrating in these renderings right now. Uh, we do think it's uh, important probably to identify a location for buses, for visiting teams, et cetera, and make sure they have a place to park. Um, we would propose a uh, synthetic turf field here with a you know, collegiate level rubber track for uh, track and field. The air. The, one of the main concerns of the current stadium and field are the wetlands. So I'm gonna, going to go on the assumption that when you're dropping these tennis courts there, like you said, you're, you'll show without the. Yeah, they're there. outside the wetlands. All right. But we will show that. We'll show that delineation. Can I ask a question about the track? Is is the track a standard size? Is that the same as what we have there now? I think right now you only have six lanes. Six lanes. Okay. This would be eight. Be this would be able to host events. Dave? Yeah, I was going to say, and, and actually, Don probably knows this better. Um, the current stadium, also, the soccer field is not regulation width. Is that correct? So this has a regulation width soccer field plus the eight lane track. Yeah, that's what you see in that white outline that is under, underneath of the football stadium. You can't see it very well in this rendering, but that's what makes this track a little wider than typical, is so that you can fit a soccer field inside. I know this is a drawing and rendering, but the width of the soccer field, is that accurate or are we still, some of the tracks that we played at, the line goes right to the track, it's not, so I'm just wondering, does there, have a buffer zone between I guess, the sideline of the soccer field, not that's football, but the soccer and the track. Sure, so <clears throat> because this would be a completely new installation with ample property and real estate, all of the setbacks should be able to be met, all the sizes should be able to be met. There's, you are, let me just go back one, there's a little bit of a limitation in the length, but again, this is just a rendering. Once we lay this over an actual survey, I'm pretty confident we're gonna have all the room that we need to make this properly dimensioned. The, the other component to this is, if central office remains, then 
that changes the site plan. It moves the parking, the majority of the parking, to the, I'll say, the back side or the left side of the field, and it brings it a little bit closer. Still able to keep the future field house as a prominent piece to this uh, complex, but you see it just really shifts the field from the left to the right if central office remains here. There was no impact on the potential tennis courts and, and pickleball court. So those are the, the two options that we have developed to fit the complex at the Curtis Corner Middle School site. I'm certainly happy to answer more questions. I completely agree that all the dimensioning should be what it should be. There's really no reason to constrict anything here. Bill, you done? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll just take it, I typically go around the table and let everyone take a crack and certainly ask Phil any questions you want, make any comments, um, we can get into discussion, but just to give everyone a fair shot, I usually take it one at a time and then we can have open discussion. So I'll actually go to my left this time as Dave looks away because I know he doesn't like to be first. Um, that's right. So Danielle, okay. Brian? Next. No, nope. uh, that's a fair question. Uh, just if you could, Sue, I forgot to mention this, try to speak into the mic so the video, but Phil, you heard that, right? Sure, yes, I did. It's appropriately sized for locker rooms, concessions, other... Correct. The field house has not been programmed, but there is significant square footage for uh, restrooms, uh, concessions, athletic field storage, uh, team rooms and locker rooms. Um, so... There is enough space there to program, I don't want to say whatever you want, but what we would typically find in an athletic field house at a campus like this, which are again, restrooms, concessions, storage, team and locker rooms. Oh, this does not go back any farther than your current football field because your current football field is partially in wetlands and there's a buffer that we need to stay away from that. So this does not go beyond the current football. So it won't encroach any, it won't encroach any of those playing fields. This is all on the, the existing middle school. All on the front. Yeah, that, that front property. <laughs> and just so the, the commission members know, part of the reason, well, a big part of the reason we can't do the field house at this time is funding. Um, we've built in about six million prospectively into our funding scheme for this facility that basically covers the field, the track, the, the stadium seating, but does not include a field house. And also field houses are not reimbursable through ride. So we would not get half reimbursement on that. So that creates a little bit more of a hurdle in funding something like that. So hopefully booster clubs, other funding can come into play to eventually construct that. But we have asked Phil to obviously carve it out and plan it in sort of a box format for future. John, did you have, or Joanne, did you? tennis and pickleball courts you have that what looks to be like a walkway yes um, and then 
to the far right, is that a, a small building or? So what we've identified was a future pad site that it's not uncommon for storage buildings to just start popping up on athletic campuses. So that is just meant to indicate that we would expect something to go there. And then I, I assume that bathrooms would be incorporated in the preliminary construction along with the bleachers um, because there won't be any field house there'll be some type of bathroom facility planning in the interim. So we, we have not yet moved the program to that level yet. Um, obviously restroom facilities are something that need to be considered right. at an event space. No, and then I, I think the only thing I'd add is just a comment that you know, for us on the Rec Commission with previous plans that had been floated for the schools and facilities, a, a big concern of ours was encroachment onto, you know, the Curtis Corner play fields as they exist today. Um, you know, that's a, one of our signature locations. There's a lot of activities that take place there, cross country tracks there, disc golf courses there, you know, so we were very concerned that we were gonna lose a lot of that space. This obviously would alleviate that concern um, and adding the field turf space, I know it would be a huge uh, advantage to the athletic director who currently you know, juggles fields and locations and busing kids just to get practices and games. So this would be a huge win for you know, us and the school department, I feel. Get it? A little wonky. Recorded yet, and that's why you need I'd probably say that in terms of the quantity that we have identified, it's probably about the same. In this plan, you see that it's decentralized and We'll go back to the other plan. Here it tends to be more centralized. Certainly, it, 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 no, it's a very good idea. It's an asset that you would have to, it gives you more flexibility and opportunities. To that point, this design would be an improvement because you would have two accesses to Curtis Corner Road, which currently you don't have. The field cuts off that back access. Um, you know, but yeah, of course, if that's what you want, then that's fine. Jim? I think it's beautiful on the positive side. Um, you really think that we're gonna be able to build that for $6 million? 
I mean, that's a lot of construction. Um, and, you know, I look at, like, the, the tennis courts, the pickleball courts. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Um, but we already have some on the other side behind the central office. There's no way of relocating that parking lot and leaving those and probably saving a ton of money doing that. Or uh, that's, that's my first thought. Maybe put the parking lot in the corner over there. Um, but I'd really be curious to see you really think that what we see right there is doable for $6 million? So we're going, to, we're going to go through an estimating exercise right now, and we will have a better idea of where that is. Uh, the, th the third thing is the central office. So that's a building that's extremely expensive, I agree, to, to rebuild that. So I would think that would stay, um, but I'm not the superintendent. I would ask him, if, you know, if he's here, I'd ask him, are you planning on keeping that? Um, but the, if, if not there, where would it go? The Hazard Building? I mean, it's still, that's still a good building. I mean, it, it, it needs a lot of, I don't think it is necessarily a good building. Still, uh, well, I mean, it, needs, it probably needs cosmetics, I'm sure, but it's still a stable. It, it needs, it needs up significant upgrades. Bill, as part of your assessments, did you evaluate the roof and structural on that building? We did not assess the central plant, the central district office building. Uh, we, we can. I was going to say, it may be something we want to put a pin in because I do think... It, it has been as yeah. part of the Jacobs report. I, I, don't, I couldn't come up with a number off the top of my head right now, but I know it is not just painting it. Absolutely. And, and I'm not saying to, but I think we need to know what the information is. Like, where does it stand? Because the question is likely to come up to the town manager's point of it's a building, right? People's first inclination is to say it's cheaper to just maintain a building even if you have to upgrade it. It's got sewer, it's got water, it's got, you know, it's got walls. So I, I can't, I think in order to discuss intelligently that, we need to have some sort of report that says it's so bad that we just have to get rid of it, or what would it take to get it to a format that we want, whether it be for administration, and I'm not advocating one way or another, or for field house or other, you know, or maybe it just comes down. That's my thought, anyway. You're in the midst. Oh, sorry. That's it. <laughs> That's all I got. Yeah, when, when we're done, Dorald, we'll, um, who's next? Kate? Me. Um, no, I think it's beautiful. I appreciate, and I appreciate the dialogue and the points, because if we could keep tennis courts where they are, you know, why move them if we don't have to? But again, if they need, and, and I can't speak as far as are, the, are they adequate? And I think Terry Lynch may also, are they adequate for what he does with them now? Are they adequate for what you guys utilize them for? Because I know it's shared space now between tennis and pickleball, <clears throat> and this breaks, it, breaks them apart, so that might be ideal. Um, again, the point with the central office building, what, you know, what, will it, what will it be? I don't think we've made a definitive decision as to where we're putting central office just yet. Um, but in general, the question of is it, can you do it for $6 million, I don't think it's an unreasonable, um, I, I don't think that is unreasonable for $6 million only because I'm aware of how much Prout's cost and what they have, and it's not too far off. Um, but again, price of materials and labor is significantly different from when they did that. So, no, I think it's, I think it's amazing, and um, I'm just... Happy to continue exploring it all. All right, John. All right, thank you. I, I mean, I'm in full support of this as well. It looks beautiful. To me, it's at this point a dream come true. <laughs> um, <clears throat> had a couple questions. Does this include lights? Is this part of the. Pardon me? Lights. Yeah, I don't think we've gone that far yet in terms of the design discussions, but it, you could. In my opinion, you could put lights here and not really have some issues that are associated with lighting fields. Um, you've got a lot of good buffer around here. So uh, putting lights on the field gives you a lot more opportunities. So I would say, I would anticipate that our ride stage two submission would include lights on the field. That's an expense. You know, I'm thinking of it from an expense point. If we're not thinking lights, we should be thinking lights. 
Um, and does this plan affect the bike path at all or the trails that are off the bike path right there? So oh, this is I, I don't think so. And, and I think what we really want to do is take one of these plans and expand it a little bit more, move out, go to a higher elevation so we, where you can see more so you don't see that we impact the fields that you currently have so we can show the bike path, show that line of wetlands. Dave? Thanks, Phil. Uh, looks great, as usual. Um, uh, looking at the, the road, I think you're totally within the sight of the, uh, of the middle school, just knowing the, knowing the, the, the roads. Um, personally, I actually like this one better because I think we do need to show the central office, um, but you're going to have the additional expense of not having the centralized parking because you're going to have more curb work and things like that. So if there was a way to you know, keep the central office, keep those tennis courts and still group the parking, um, I think that'd be even better. But, you know, as I mentioned last time with the school design, I think we're at a point where we're good for cost estimate and we can move forward to cost estimate. So I'd recommend when, when the chair gets, gets done that we, we move that. Um, lights are critical. We have them now. We need them um, for this to get the maximum use out of it. Oh, she looks good, and I can't believe I'm the one left to say this, but uh, we need more pickleball courts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first, uh, thanks for your, your work on this. I mean, this helps to have something to respond to as opposed to just say, what do you want? You know, it, it gives us a couple options. Um, I do think the comment on restrooms is going to be critical. Like, we have to build that in some way. You can't assume that we're not going to have it, which means that we're either doing porta potties out there for big games, which I don't think is going to be acceptable. So we, we're going to have to have that infrastructure. So the question becomes, we have central office, which has infrastructure, or can we get the infrastructure here with a smaller building for our price point? And that's where I, I do have concerns because, you know, I, I worked on the first two synthetic, I oversaw the construction of the first two synthetic facilities in Boston. It was 20 years ago, and it was $1.3 million then for just the field, synthetic turf, field, and track. That's more than doubled. Lights, restrooms, stadium, parking, circulation, I mean, it's pretty easy to calculate that we're gonna probably blow six million pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have to value engineer, but we have to have the basics. So the restrooms, I think, are a basic component. Um, lights, I, I agree with Dave, like, I think, and I would say the committees, we have lights there now. There's going to be an expectation there'll be lights on this field. So again, value engineering, but lights could be a million easy at this facility. So um, I'm interested in the Recreation Commission's take on distributed parking. The one thing I think about is when you have it all on one side, it doesn't really service the rest of the facility. You had it on the other side, other side meaning the main access drive that goes into the back recreation complex. Do you feel that would be a benefit to the rest of the recreation facility or do you think it's neutral. Whether the buildings, the central office is there or not, would distributed parking be a benefit or drawback or do you see a difference? I think we're far enough away from the fields that these parking would be, ex I mean it's a long walk actually from that parking area back to the other fields and it's kind of uphill. So I don't, I don't think this parking area would be used for the other fields. I think the other fields have enough parking for what they, they use. Everyone pretty much in agreement with that? Okay. We're good at asking the question. I, I, just, I just wanted to say, from a recreational point of view, I totally agree with Dave, but as a user of the fields, I can't anticipate that the distributed parking areas would be more useful for you know, teams dropping off on their own home side as opposed to having to walk on lawns. And more. As long as all the parking's on the home side, we're all good. We don't care if the visitors walk, right? Um, okay, I just figured I'd ask the question. I'm interested you're here. Um, I did want to add. Um, I'm not sure, and I'll just kind of throw this out there, at least in the soccer world, I'm not sure the visitor stands or having both stands on either side. Um, I mean, even for the final, Cranston Stadium was the biggest crowd we've had as a high school team. and. 
the other side wasn't even full at all. Like it was all full on that one side. <clears throat> so I'm wondering this in light of the cost savings and the discussion that we're having and the distribution of parking. That's the one point I'd make. The other point I'd make is, you know, we may not need that separate little parking area for the buses. I mean, you're gonna have one bus, two buses maybe for football. That to have, you know, that's when we start getting, it's true. So as I say that, if we start using the facility for other things besides football and soccer, and track, you have tournaments, and you definitely have buses and stuff that it opens up that whole opportunity for that. So, but my real main point is the the dual stands. I mean, we probably don't need a monster home stand. We don't probably. I would say we don't need you know the visitor side. Football is different. We definitely get more crowds for the football games. But yeah, I, I agree with Sean. <coughs> I actually was going to mention the same thing that from a cost savings perspective, I think. One of the first, the first thing I would eliminate would be the visitor side. Uh, you when you go around to other schools, fast North Kingstown, it's all on one side. Narragansett, their new facility that's not that new anymore, but it, it's all on one side. And you know, I think that would be a place where we could you know, cut first. Uh, that's good feedback because we are going to have to likely go through a value engineering exercise. So, you know, our goal, I think, the committee's goal is to get a high quality, and we've talked about synthetic turf, high quality facility as far as a field and track and essential supporting elements. And then if the other stuff has to be filled in over time, we can do that. But we don't know what we don't know, right? Estimating is gonna be key. The other thing with central office, just so the Recreation Commission knows what's been discussed is the ha existing hazard building, which is a um, multiple of things in it now, which does need some upgrades, may be a possibility for the central administration. Um, however, the whole project is, you know, it would have to be cost contained. So if that's not possible, they may stay, and that's why we're having that discussion. Now, whether a restroom room facilities could also be just on a limited basis extended off the back as maybe a short-term solution to restrooms or things like that. So those are all things that Phil's gonna have to work with us. I think we're gonna have to look at the cost here based on this and start saying what's priority. Um, that's it. I, that's all I have. Any other questions, comments from the committee, either committee, commission? All right. So then I'll, I'll ask for the public to chime in so everyone can hear and I'll open up public comment at this time. So anybody wish to come up to the podium and provide comment or have any questions on this topic item only? And we'll do three minutes. You good with uh, Doral Beasley? Um, okay, so I'm, I'm I'm getting confused here because I thought when we at the last presentation when. when we looked at the site where the high school is going to go, that it was already set in stone that the administration was going to move to hazard. I thought that was set in stone. There's nothing set in stone. There's nothing set in stone. All of these things are conceptual. All of these things are planning. We're, we're still, we're just out of stage one. We haven't even gotten into stage two. There's yeah, nothing but, set in stone. Okay, but I don't see any sense of, of having the administration here and they can be next to the high school. And, and that's ideal, so, and let me Doral, just, though that's ideal, and that's what we would like to see too, okay. but we are, have constraints. So anyway, in my estimation, that it, that's an 80 by 100, it's 8,000 square foot building. I, I don't personally don't see any reason why it's still there, why you would keep it. Um, it where you have the, the tennis courts in the, in the upper right, so it, Thinking about the, topo the topography of, of the site, about half of that, the northern half of this field is gonna be in, a, in an area where it's, the elevation of the ground is gonna have to be raised up considerably to get it out of the wetland issue. But those tennis courts over there to the left, you're not gonna raise, you're not gonna raise all of that area up to get it out of the wetlands 
because those, those, they're over there in the, in the danger zone. So Phil, do you want to address that at all? Or I, I think this is where it'd be helpful to see what existing conditions versus the proposed would be, and I did ask for that. So I, I, I'm hopeful that you can provide that so we can see that's something you can do. Because yeah. okay. it, you know, this is a big area, and over time, the, you would hope that, that there would be no settling to it. Anyway, um, well, it's a it's a fair comment, and I think what we'll ask Phil to do is is provide that information because what we need to know at this point is what generally can fit. We're we're far from locked in, and where exactly it is. So if we need to slide those, we can do it anytime, and we'll have a survey soon with topography. So. Uh, last thing is, um, what what is a modern field house house, house for? What, what's in it? What would be in a field house? What facilities are in a field house? Usually, a it's case. I don't know. Store maintenance equipment, because even with a synthetic field, you have brush groomers. You have you know you can have tractors, things like that. Um, locker facilities, restrooms. Sometimes they have a team, just a team meeting room or a, a general open facility. So it really depends on how big the field house would be. So that's where, again, cost comes in. You can make an enormous field facility. You can make a very small, bare bones sort of what would be considered an enhanced shed that carries the basic facilities. So the field house is, is that like that little green yes. boot looking thing there? Yes, that's correct. I hear that. They have a beautiful one down in Charho that the, um, it, um, yeah, Mad Maddie Potts's foundation, they fundraise for it, and I think that's kind of what, to Phil's point, is it wouldn't necessarily be part of this project, but it was something that if we went a fundraising route or boosters route, it could be added. Yes, sir. Three minutes is up. They're all, uh, you... oh, I'm done. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll add one last clarifying comment just for the benefit of anyone listening or watching, the committee had talked about moving the administration to hazard and built in, in our financial model that was proposed as part of a $150 million project at cost. That was not part of the $125 million. So if we're going to move in that direction, we're going to have to figure out how we value engineer. We're not sure where the costs are going to fall on our core project, which is the high school. We need a high quality high school and we're going for a high quality athletic complex. So to Kate's point, nothing's fixed in stone. If we can find the money, we will look at the administration, but that's a third tier priority at this point. So I just want to be clear on that. that when I, it's not that it's off the table, but we, can only, we only have funding for X. And we're going to be hearing tonight about sustainable building design and geo wells and all these things that cost additional money. And this is all going to come to the table at some point with all that cost data because, quite frankly, I don't think we're going to be able to afford everything. So the community needs to understand that, that we still have a lot of tough decisions ahead of us. All right, um, before I ask the Recreation Commission to adjourn, do you have any last comments or questions you'd like of us? And like I said, you're welcome to stay, but um, you don't have to hang here. No. And I thank you for, on behalf of the committee, I, I really appreciate you coming. I think this is big in, in being part of the process and we're always willing to you know, reach out if you need additional information or you want to be collaborative in any way. So go ahead and adjourn. No, I, and I agree, I, it, I think it, you know, the entire Recreation Commission showed up, so it shows you that we appreciate being part of the conversation um, and would like to continue to be you know, as things develop. So thank you for uh, including us. Um, so do we need a full motion for adjournment for the recreation with a vote or? Well, it's, your, it's, it's actually a meeting within a meeting. So yeah, I would, I would go ahead and just call, you know, call the adjournment, yep, for a vote. Okay, could I have a motion for adjournment? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Motion by Joanne. Second. Second by Sean. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. Thank you very much. I appreciate your work. All right, so the committee will move on. Yeah, we'll let them. Yeah, so just to, on this, finish up on this, on this topic, um, and I know you've got a lot of work left to do, Phil. Um, I know we talked about 
Um, I do agree the uh, visiting stand's probably unnecessary based on just the way things are done in Rhode Island and the crowds that we get. So that might be some cost savings. But I do know you have other additional work. We talked about the need for ADA accessibility to the um, press box and if that means we build into the hillside a little bit more. So, you know, to Dorald's point, I mean, you don't, we can't fill a wetland, but there is some gradation that has to be done to, uh, to level it off. So still a lot of work, um, but I'm comfortable uh, moving forward on a cost estimate. So I'd like to make the motion that we move forward uh, the cost estimate of this um, second design, keeping central, um, keeping the building for now for the central um, administration um, and move that into the cost estimate stage. Second. All right, we have a second. Is there any discussion? No? Is it possible to have both with and without the admin building there? Mm -hmm. well, then I will amend my motion to uh, take it to cost estimation for the facility of, um, as, you, uh, you'll, uh, as you've designed. Okay. Second. We have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. You have clear direction. Thanks, Phil. So we'll, uh, we'll expect that you'll be moving forward with cost estimating with design tweaks to follow, right? All right, moving on. Uh, we have a presentation by Studio Jade on the building concept design. So Phil and I had uh, spoken um, earlier this week or mm -hmm. last week, I don't know, the weeks blend together. Um, Phil wanted to present an, an, uh, uh, another option. There was several options sort of shown initially for the survey. There was a more refined option shown at our last meeting for the high school design. We received some feedback on that with regards to site circulation, parking, uh, the building facing and the entries. So Phil wanted to update us on that and where he is with some of the tweaks. We did authorize him to move forward with estimating. So what I'm expecting is that this will not impact heavily any cost, but it's to show the community what I've, I think what we've asked Phil to do is continue to tweak and revise to get it closer to the vision that the community would like to realize, right? May not be perfect, we still have stage three, but get it to a point that people, what we're selling through a bond is a reasonable expectation of what would be, be built. And then the second thing that Phil's gonna talk to is the green building design and options there. So, Phil, it's your show. Great, thank you. So, we heard a couple points at the last meeting, as Luke just mentioned, the orientation of the school, the main entrance, does it face School Street? Could it maybe a connection between Hazard Building and the school through a courtyard? And is there a way to simplify some of the vehicular circulation and maybe even eliminate that loop road that we had around the new Hazard Field area? So. I do want to thank my staff and, and team. Uh, Nimish Patel is one of our designers. Nimish and I have been working together for 20 years. Told him what I needed last week and uh, him and the group were able to come up with another set of uh, images for us to talk. So this is a new site plan that you could see where the school, instead of being uh, an L, it's now really a bar same components that we had in the last meeting, but the main entrance now is facing School Street. We're able to develop a plaza between the Hazard Building and the new building. That's where the outdoor senior dining is as well. We dedicated a roadway for a bus drop-off and then broke off of that additional parking. This parking count comes very close to what you have currently. And as you see in this next image, we have eliminated that loop road around the new hazard fields and shown you here a walking trail. Uh, students that are parking uh, along the roadway, walking through, um, was it, is it Church Street maybe that they're coming up? Uh, they would be entering the site off of that roadway that terminates right here where the cursor is. So those students would walk along the trail, coming here at the only crossing that students who park here could come into this entrance at the school. So this plan uh, 
in the interior of the building is even easier to manage in terms of circulation because now we've identified basically a cross. So, and at the intersection of that cross is where you would imagine to find this student commons area, the cafeteria, which is, right, which is similar to what it was before, adjacent to the gym and the auditorium. So you do have that overflow space. And you see the short direction come straight through to the main entrance where you see the SK in the plaza along School Street. So I'll walk you through some renderings of uh, what this would look like. So this is an image looking back from School Street to the main entrance. You start to see the plaza developing on the left between Hazard and the academic portion of the building. Uh, when we went from an L to a bar, that rotated the academic core, the tower, and it put it in the most optimal orientation for uh, natural daylighting. Classrooms really want to run east-west, which they now do in this bar concept. We continued with the same features we presented last week. Again, this is just a little bit more of a close-up of that area between Hazard and the new building. This is looking in the other direction if you're coming up School Street. Again, all of the components have essentially stayed the same. We just really took the ad academic tower from an L to a bar. So instead of this being the view as if someone was driving around those fields, this would be the view as if someone is walking along that trail. Again, if you were to come down Columbia, again, we have this same features we had before, and you start to see the student dining and plaza area, uh, which would be coming off of the cafeteria. Again, similar to what we had last time, the media center is that second story space that's looking out over the fields, the classrooms looking out over the fields and the plaza. And now we have a really nice opportunity for some hardscape features between the Hazard Building and the new high school. You see we have student dining. You know, the, the arts is something we heard a lot here. Maybe this becomes a little outdoor amphitheater um, where they could have some outdoor performances, a place for students to congregate when they are dropped off along the bus lane that is uh, shown right here. So those are the images that we have put together in the bar building. Again, in terms of estimating, really not much of a significant difference. We are going to be estimating, I believe, the plan that we just showed you because it captures a little bit more and I'd rather capture more now so that you have as much information as possible. Um, because I also think there are some savings built into this plan as well. So this, this would be the option that we would recommend moving forward with for estimating. Just the removal of that long road. Again. Sure. So with that, I'll, I'll ask for questions or comments from the committee or go to my right, Dave, anything? I think it's better. And it's definitely better, the connection to Hazard and the elimination of that loop road and making that a more walkable um, site. Uh, I agree, all, all, well done. Um, hey, Ryan. Um, on the athletic side, was that similar to the last plan where it have a separate entrance for like athletics and performances? Bill, can you go back to the, yeah, just because I have this up on video, just go back to the plan. Go to the close one. So I would anticipate that both this, what I'll call the rear entrance and the main entrance are in a line. So 
if I come in the main entrance or I were to come in that rear entrance, we would be facing each other, meeting in the common space with the auditorium and the gym immediately to our right. Similar as it was in the other plan, the, the, the back side of the plan really hasn't changed. It was just this academic core and the admin that we moved from the L to the bar. Thank you. Jim? Uh, most of the negative comments I got a couple of weeks ago was the uh, location of the main entrance. This was the one that just a handful of people that contacted me, like uh, School Street entrance. So I, I do like that better. I, I just like the way it students in and out looks safer to me than a bottleneck in a corner somewhere and uh, it uh, I think the way all the parking surrounds that configuration is pretty uh, pretty good so I, I really like this configuration here there there's some work that will need to be done with this ride has regulations for Chevron parking for busing there is a process where you can appeal and, and ask for a variance for that. They have been granting variances. So uh, keep in mind in, in the future, there will be some discussions, that's all. But recognizing what you're trying to do at the site and how we would protect the students, I don't know if you can see it, but I wanted to make sure in case someone were to ask. Uh, in that site, you saw that there was a bus lane and student parking beyond it. So how would you protect students who may be parking along this from walking across while buses are dropping off or picking up? And if you see in this rendering this fence that runs all the way along, the only spot where students can go from the field side to the school side is at that ceremonial crossing which would be a lot easier to manage than multiple points. So I wanted to put that and point that out because it, in case someone picked it up in their review. Brian? I just agree with what's already been stated. I like this better. I do feel like it's safer and I like that you touched on the interior is easier to manage too because I think that's important. Um, I want to thank you, first off, and your team to, for the hard work. I know that was put into this. I know this is a lot. Um, but I think it matters, and I, this is why, because going through this process takes it to the next level, and I think you did that here. Um, I like the compact design. I like the fact that, you, you know, my original thought was have this big, grand courtyard, but I think you did that, but in a different way, with that site grading, and there's a lot of opportunity there for, for community gathering space, student gathering space. We'll have to work on the fence, make sure it's not a standard chain link you know, monstrosity eventually, you know, maybe something cool that could be done. But um, I think from a building standpoint, having a T design, clear entries is what, to Jim's point, is what I heard. I also heard, as you know, about the loop road and eliminating as much parking to that side and really pushing it away from the neighborhood as much as possible. I think this is the strike compromise, right? We need the, the building to function, maximize parking to what we can, and we minimized the footprint. So I think you did a great job. So I'm, in, you know, I'm really, I think what we're, we're hearing is well in favor of using this as sort of our model concept moving forward. Um, is every, everyone in agreement with that? Okay. So this would be the one that we're kind of showing to the community, unless you have some, you know, reason to tweak or, or things come back from ride that are definitely a no-go. Um, if you're okay, you're good with that, Bill. Yes. I'm sure you are. Yeah, yeah, we're fine. We're good. <laughs> Stop working. <laughs> um, all right, excellent. Thank you for all the hard work that was put into this. Um, anything, uh, I'll open it up to the community for short community comments. Anybody? So three minutes. The last um, committee meeting that you had at the, in the high school cafeteria, I asked um, Mr. Conte, well, I, I mentioned to him, we were talking about the, the different renditions of, of the 53 possibilities. Um, and I said, gee, I really like brick. And he mentioned to me, 
that brick is good because it's cheaper than steel, right? Is that what, is that what you told me? That so to, to build portions of your school using brick is less expensive than if you, if you have steel facades and stuff like that. That's all. Um, the, 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 the last rendition was the um, academic wing, was that three stories? It, yeah. Okay. I, I, didn't, I didn't remember that. Is there ded dedicated student parking? So in other words, in all that parking area that you have there, is there going to be a section of it that's dedicated specifically for students, say the seniors, or are there no, is there no student parking and the students are going to just park all over town like they do now? Well, I, I think what we do know is it's equivalent parking what they have, so it needs to be managed. We're not part of the management, but I know right now they have senior designated, correct? They have senior designated. My understanding of the rendition is actually what we're looking at right right now. That would be the senior parking. That would be the student parking. And then to his point before, the juniors that if they do park down the road or have to park down the road, they can walk up, I think it's Brown Street, and get on the white, the walking path at that field and, and again, come in this parking lot right here with that white stripe. So it's safer than what they're dealing with right now. Um, and now that, now that the, the hazard fields are just open spaces, is it, is it, is it the thought that there will be high school athletic events that will take place on possibly one of those? I mean, you could, could you have a, a lacrosse game there? Could you have a soccer game? Is it, I mean, if, and if I mean, you could, would, 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 they would use it would, now, would, right? To use that? it for right now, they use it for practices, South County youth lacrosse and youth soccer cheerleading. It all takes place on that. I don't know. Obviously, Terry Lynch would have have the say over whether or not you had the actual game there. I don't know that our high school athletics plays any actual games, but they utilize it for their sports for sure. Yeah. What's that? And, and to the point, it's what we can do is what we can do now. So what they, you know, I would say equivalent value. I mean, we, under the, the federal guidelines as far as the restriction, land and water conservation restriction, we're supposed to be providing a schedule, but it can be used by school activities. It just can't be used exclusively for school activities. All right, and the last thing is the, that little walking path. If you put that walking path around the entire field, then you could run on it. I don't think anybody else? All right, then we will we'll move on and Studio Jade again has a presentation on the uh, green building design. Uh, yes. All right, so it's, it's appropriate for us to have some high level discussions on high performance building and sustainable design as you start moving through stage two into a potential stage three with a, a favorable bond vote. There's a couple things that we as a company focus on when we talk about high performance building and sustainable design. And those four things are really indoor air quality, acoustics, natural daylighting, and of course, thermal comfort. And I have taken a very complex issue and I'm presenting it in a very simple way. So uh, just be mindful of that, that there is a lot more information than what I'm gonna be presenting to you, but I'm trying to do it in a way that you understand how we think and some things that you should think about going forward. So we're always looking for the best way to do these four things. And for example, I'll just point out daylighting. When we rotated that building and put it in the bar, all of those classrooms now are benefiting from having the proper orientation for natural lighting, which means that we're gonna be able to harvest 
daylight and reduce electricity. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, some of these are non-negotiable, right? There is the code minimum, then there is a best practice, and then, of course, you can take it even farther. And, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit more. You absolutely need to know that we will be not just the code minimum. We want to introduce best practices for a variety of reasons. I'm going to present to you the extreme, and then you'll see that we're probably going to land somewhere in the middle. So all of the information I'm going to talk about, the, the sources that I got my information from are listed here, right? It's the U.S. Department of Energy. It's ASHRAE. I give you the abbreviations and the names in case someone wants to explore these concepts further. But I didn't make the stuff up that I'm presenting to you. It all comes from one of these sources. So let's talk about a zero energy school. And, and what is a zero energy school? So first and foremost, it is an extremely, extremely energy efficient building. That's the first part. It is so energy efficient that if you introduce an on-site renewable source, such as solar panels or a wind turbine, you're able to meet or exceed what you use on an annual basis. And it's important to know annual because there will be certain times of the year where you are consuming more energy than you're producing, and other times of the years you'll pre be producing more energy than what you're using. That's what zero energy means. I don't want anybody to think that there's a building out there that just operates on its own. It's always connected to the utilities. So this is a very lofty goal, and we're going to talk about some examples, and we'll see what um, discussion there is afterwards. So there are zero energy school categories, and it starts with being zero energy ready, meaning you probably did the first part. You created the most energy efficient building you can. You just not yet have introduced this on-site renewable source. Then there's zero energy emerging. There are people that have designed this very efficient energy building. They have introduced some renewable resource, but they're not able to say that they're producing more than they're consuming on an annual basis. And then, of course, there is the premier zero energy, where you are, on an annual basis, producing more energy than you're consuming. What are the benefits of a zero energy school? These are benefits that I found through those resources that said it encourages student learning, it creates healthy learning environments, sound fiscal management, and it demonstrates environmental leadership. I agree with all four of those things. I do take exception that it's not, the, these are not the benefits of only a net zero school. These should be the benefits of basically any school project that you're doing. So, I don't want you to think that if you set a lofty goal and you do not meet it, that you're not doing these four things because I can tell you, even at the code minimum, and even with best practices, you're able to do these four things. So how many net zero or called zero energy schools are there? I should have asked this as a quiz, actually. That would have been very interesting. Um, but according to a 2020 buildings list, there's approximately 230 ultra low energy or zero energy school buildings in the United States and Canada. When you consider how many school buildings there are in the United States and Canada, 230 is not many. Well, what is that? I don't know. That was a quiz for me, and I failed miserably. I will know that next time. So zero energy schools are about balancing. 
these two parts, low energy use and a renewable on-site energy production. You have to have both of them. So zero energy schools, they, they are attainable. And the first step is setting a, a measurable goal while maintaining a reasonable budget. We're gonna talk about this acronym EUI. EUI is the energy use intensity. All right, and this school building committee may elect to set a target, EUI, for your project. It's not appropriate to set it in stage two, stage three and beyond, yes. So EUI, energy use intensity. That refers to the amount of energy used per square foot annually, all right? So let me give you some examples that can probably make this very easy to understand. A church, for example, has an EUI of 30.5. If you compare that to a hospital at 234, you, you can start to understand why there's a difference. Churches are used, you know, once a week. Um, you know, they're not, they're not running eight hours, 12 hours a day, as opposed to a hospital which is running 24-7. And you can see why an office has an EUI of probably of 52. All right, that makes sense. It's, it's not running 24 hours, but it is running five days a week during business hours. Retail, restaurants and stores has 103. Okay, that makes sense to me. It's, it's open longer, it's got more lighting, it's got heating and air conditioning um, that, that's running constantly to keep you know, all their customers happy. So I wanted you to just familiarize yourself with this range and EUI. Now the medium, I should have asked another quiz question. Damn, this would have been fun. The medium EUI for a school is 48.5. So let's see how that fits in here. Okay, that, that makes sense to me. Schools run five days, well, we're gonna talk about operations in a minute. 48.5 fits in the range between a church and an office building, right? If you think about it operating Monday through Friday from you know, eight to four, assuming there's not activities at night, not activities on the weekends, um, many schools are not air conditioned. Um, and again, this, this is across the, the country. I just wanted you to be familiar with EUI because you may, as a, as a committee, want to set a target. So there are two perspectives in zero energy schools. So achieving a very low EUI, that's the primary goal because you need that to do anything, right? You need the most energy efficient building you can get. So whether you are going to have a renewable source on site, um, the first thing is to make sure you have the lowest EUI you can. The second perspective is that achieving zero energy performance makes no sense if the school is not maintained for the long term. That's a big part of this, right? You know, um, there was a time when, when LEED first came out, we could have designed a LEED building, no problem. It could have actually performed terrible for you from an energy standpoint. Now that has shifted, right? And, and that's appropriate now. So again, the primary goal should be achieving the lowest EUI you can. So Rogers High School, the anticipated EUI there is 30. Now that's a little high for what we can design now, but the caveat here is that that is a full comprehensive CTE school with culinary and a lot of energy using uh, equipment and, and components. Um, so our anticipated target is, is 30. And again, here it is just in the ranking.
Now, if the charge was to get to a zero energy building based on our climate zone here, which is 5A, you would need to get an EUI at 19.1. That's the first part, that's part one. Get our EUI to about 19, and then with on-site renewables, you could probably get to zero energy. Getting to 19 is, would be difficult, and, and there are costs associated with that. But we're gonna run through some examples of people that have done it. So Richardsville Elementary in 2011 was the first zero energy school in Kentucky. They had an EUI of 18.2, and you see the large solar array over the parking canopy, and there is solar arrays on the main building. So they started at the 18.2, they supplemented it with a significant amount of solar, that's how they got to zero energy. Discovery Elementary School in Virginia, 2015, it's a zero energy school. They started with an EUI of 14.7 and they were able to achieve their zero energy through the use of their photovoltaics on their new building. This is another elementary school in Kentucky. They had an EUI of 15.5 and they supplement it with PV on their roof to achieve zero energy. And lastly, St. James Intermediate School in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, 2018, they had an EUI of 14.3 and they supplemented it with photovoltaics on the roof. Are, they, are, they, are these, all these examples only using solar, like solar panels on, or are they, do they have other green? Oh, stay tuned, oh, okay. it's coming. So you know, out of the 230 that there are in the United States and, and Canada, these are four of them. So what are the zero energy school components? Yeah. So I have, a, there's a number of them, well, we're gonna go through them. Obviously, the solar photovoltaic systems. They were all geothermal water source heat pump systems with a dedicated outdoor air system. They had super insulated walls and roofs. They had a continuous air and vapor barrier. They had daylight harvesting. They had LED lighting. They had high efficiency glazing. They optimized orientation of their building. They had enhanced commissioning, they had low flow fixtures, they had efficient appliances and equipment, and they had reduced their plug loading. Now this one is very important that you understand what this actually means. We're renovating schools where classrooms only have like one or two outlets. Now the new classrooms we're putting in have, I don't know, 10? Every time you give somebody an opportunity to plug something in, they will plug it in. If you go down the path of an ultra low energy EUI, or of course zero energy, there is a significant operations component to this, an, an educational component to everyone. Lights are going off at certain times. There are, you're not plugging in, a teacher's not plugging in her, her coffee warmer or microwave or anything. The, the restrictions on plug loading is probably one of the more challenging pieces to this. How is the building operated? When do the systems come on? When do they go off? You may have been in office buildings where if you plug into like the top outlet, that outlet will go off if you leave the room. You think your computer's still running. Things like that. So be very mindful of this particular item, which is absolutely critical to driving that EUI down, right? Energy use. Well, you have to limit people's ability to plug things in. So we developed this quick table that took those building components, and I gave three columns. The first column are those components that are required per 
Northeast Chips anyway for us to do a building here in Rhode Island. Then I have a column called Best Practice Feature that has two dollar signs. And I have another column that says Best Practice Feature with maybe three dollar signs. Just trying to show you that in terms of best practice, there are levels that we can go. So if you look, many of the items that I just mentioned are already required as part of Northeast Chips. They're going to expect a high efficiency HVAC system anyway. However, the ones that I just identified used a geothermal system, which comes at a premium, but is necessary to drive that EUI down. Go all the way to the bottom, the on-site renewable energy source that you would need to get to zero energy, which was a lot of solar photovoltaic systems that we saw. And again, it is a best practice, but it comes at a premium. In between, there are things that we can do. This dedicated outdoor air system, super insulating walls and roofs, those are all best practices that are probably manageable within a budget. High efficiency glazing, and of course, commissioning, going to enhanced commissioning is what we would always recommend, particularly on a building of this size and scale. And again, this reduced plug loading, it's not really applicable because this is really an operational piece. So the next steps, because we have heard that geothermal is a, is a concept that we should consider in use of uh, being able to get to a very high performing HVAC system, we have worked with Haley and Aldridge previously, so we have engaged them now and we're conducting a preliminary study of geothermal at the high school to see what is the feasibility of geothermal here. So that we're bringing back to you as much information as possible. We're doing our due diligence. Haley and Aldrich are really experts in this, the 900 engineers and scientists across the country. We worked with them at Rogers High School. We worked with them in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, I, I look forward to bringing back that feasibility study uh, to you. And that's, that's the, I'm happy to answer any questions. I got the numbers. What numbers? Uh, the ones you, the ones oh, okay. The ones you failed on. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so there's 100,000 schools in the United States, 57 million school children, 15,000 schools in Canada, 2.2 million school children. So say it's 115,000 schools, only 230 are that of the highest efficiency. It's two out of 1,000. It shows you how little. But really, and realistically, what I, I mean by all this is uh, we would have to change the way we really look and maintain our buildings throughout the state, not just in South Kingston, and devote a, a, probably a good amount of money and capital to keep this very high technology to where it needs to be. So that would have to be a very big cultural shift for not only the town, but for the state in reimbursing us and giving us some type of reason to be that highly efficient. And the, the goal and the, the charge that, we, that we're hearing from RIDE is they want us to at least drive that EUI down as much as possible to, to what the budget will allow so that you are ready, so that you could be zero energy ready. Because remember, there are two parts, and a super energy efficient building and then an on-site renewable. The on-site renewable is a challenge financially, but there are some ways that we can get that EUI down by designing a very energy efficient building so that you're ready. Who knows what the future will hold in terms of, you know, funding for photovoltaics or turbines or other on-site renewable producing uh, energy components. But once again, the, the reimbursement that we would get for being highly uh, energy efficient, not the highest, but just, what's it, two and a half percent extra? Yeah, it go varies from what, two to four percent? Two to four percent it varies. But I think we'd only be eligible because we tap out. We'd already be maxed. Yeah, so, so you figure two and a half. Two and a half, three million dollars, say. That's not a lot of money to incentive to make all these important but I changes. think the, what the incentive would be the long-term savings of energy that we wouldn't be paying out. And eventually, like I invested to put solar panels on my house 
Yes, is it an upfront cost? Mm -hmm. but I, I agree, right, but it's a long-term so cost the, and believe to maintain me, that stuff. I, I agree, because that's why. I'll just I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying we, we better be prepared to put some money aside for this. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. And, and Kate, I also have solar panels, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer, but um, in my experience, operating state budgets, or operating state buildings on the budgets that we have, those highly efficient HVAC systems rely on control systems that are so software intensive and control module intensive that these companies like Siemens and Johnson Controls try to own you and then change the software. And before you know it, you're faced with a $50,000 bill to upgrade software that you weren't expecting. So all the money you saved on not using quite as much energy, you throw away on software updates. So you gotta be really careful when you do that. So I think, it, and, and Phil highlighted that with, I think, key performance number two with about operational costs. Does anybody else have any uh, comments? Well, Brian, you're the facilities person. Um, just to highlight some of what Phil brought up and what we were all discussing here is there's definitely a cost on the other end of an initial cost to the training aspect, um, getting everybody um, on my side of it as the maintenance director to learn the new HVAC systems, um, being able to maintain them and then keep them up at a high level. Um, currently, we're down a few staff members, so it's just that daily, monthly, yearly checks, you know, making sure all the windows are sealed tight, making sure the rooftop units are all working properly, with also bringing in outside vendors, but it would, it would be something to look at as we get further in the process of, you know, it, it, just like the plug load, what on the other side, you know, what would it change in the maintenance side of the schools? And currently, just to let everyone know, we are working um, with National Grid on a upgrade to our package at the other schools. So I, as we're going along with this, I'll have more information on the current systems we're using, kind of the market that they're giving me and any incentives that I have. So I'll, and I'll work with Phil on that also. Any other comments from the side? Danielle, Brian, no? All right, uh, Phil, thanks for engaging Haley and Aldrich on this. Um, I think it's, data is important. Um, I, I echo, so I also have solar panels. I have a, a full electric truck in the parking lot. I am an adopter of new technologies and sustainability. But I'm also understanding of my threshold for tolerance and, and know that when the solar panels have to come off my roof because my ro roof needs to be, have new shingles on it, I'm gonna pay more. I know that when my boiler goes down, no one can work on it because of the chips inside it. And so would I like to have a 50-year-old boiler and sometimes? Yeah, I would because everyone can work on an old Chevy like a car, right? Just like my truck, I'm, it's, I'm indebted to Ford now because I know that they're gonna be the ones to fix it. So I do think we, we need to be smart in our decisions, balancing the true maintenance capabilities with the long-term benefit. This gets into sort of two things. One is, as you go through this process, my ask would be guide us on those decisions by having some cost data. Like what are we saving? Short-term or long-term, what's the long-term cost versus the short-term cost? So again, when those panels need to be replaced, you're saving X. When you get to the end, you're gonna spend Y. Does it make sense? The other thing, and I'll put this to the schools, and Mark's not here, but I can certainly reach out, is funding. There is a ton of funding right now through the Infrastructure Act, through other avenues. OER has a, I know at one point I was working with them with Chris Kearns from OER on uh, carports. They were incentives for carports, which could go over here. This committee doesn't have the capacity to research and to go and get that money. And so, and it's also unfair to ask our architect who's working on architectural design to go start looking at funding avenues. So, Brian, I'll put this to you as a facilities person, but you know, what is the school department doing to go out and seek to get these grants? Because the town, you know, we, we quite frankly have a lot on our plate. We're um, building a project. So if it doesn't fit into the $125 million bubble, I'm thoroughly convinced we might be able to go get that money, but it takes somebody to go get it. So where's the grant writer? Where's the personnel to go get it? And I don't know, I'm posing the question. 
but it's something we should have answered soon so that way we can fit whatever components of the project we deem valuable to a funding source that may have to be outside of the bond. So not to put you on the spot. Um, no, I, I, I agree with you and I can't speak for Mr. Prince or anybody else on the admin team, but as my role in this committee and as a taxpayer, I agree. I, every avenue we can you know, seek the funds if it's gonna lead to a better building, more sustainable building, or like you said, carports that have solar panels on them, which would be a huge upgrade or any, anything we can do, I think, you know. And many of these grants are required to come through the school district, not necessarily the town or other entities. So that's the other piece of the equation is even if we wanted to apply, we really can't. Um, so I put that out there because it's something that's going to be discussed and at some point, you know, we, if we want to fund it, um, we maybe could and there's a ton of money. I mean, I know that town manager and I um, and our entire staff are fully focused on grant and we've, we've submitted a ton lately um, for infrastructure, other projects. The money's there. It's honestly, quite frankly, like this big bag that you can't get your hands into fast enough sometimes and then you have to get it out there. And uh, we have a project, we can put a lot of money out there very quickly, so. It's great to know that you guys are going to get tons of money from all these grants. We're going for it. Well, tons so of money. No, no. But listen, tons, Jim. No, well, <laughs> that's because we're working at it, right? So <laughs> we employed a, a uh, grant manager, which I highly recommend the school department. We would love to. Because I asked my grant person, yeah. would you, they said we did do school grants, they do middle yeah. school grants. That's but a great idea. to work. We also need funds to yeah. pay that person, it, too. It would pay off a lot times a thousand. Yeah, no, agreed. So. Um, you need the money up front though. Yeah, and we did put in it for a ton of grants, stuff I didn't even know existed. No, it's awesome and I agree, I agree wholeheartedly with the sentiment on all fronts. It just, we need to be able to work together because our money comes from you guys, so we need to have a good um, reasonable relationship in order to do that, so going forward. My recommendation is put an RFQ together like we did about three yeah. months ago, put it out there, several, we got five people bidding on it, and I can guarantee one thing, for the, the money you're spending for per your month for, sure. for the grant writer yeah. um, is, is minuscule compared to the, num the money we put in for grants. We're not guaranteed to get them all, but. Yep. No, totally agree. Yep. Um, I also am curious um, if as a committee we want to invite um, the town sustainable S sustainability committee to the conversation the same way we did with the rec commission because um, they may be able to help. It may not be putting up solar panels, but they may have other, um, you know, other, I'm not um, up to speed with the sustainability committees. I know the, the school had one, but we disbanded ours to, because many of the people on it were on the town sustainability committee, so it came together. So I don't see why we couldn't tap on them and invite them in as well, and maybe they have suggestions or opportunity, or maybe they even have grant writers who could, who can assist, so. Thoughts? So, I mean, we certainly can. We invited a rec commission on that specific topic. I think when we get to a point, maybe with Haley and Aldrich, and is it Haley and Aldrich? Mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, I'm just making sure, I'm just in my mind. Uh, all right. Um, that we could, when you give a presentation maybe on their assessment and other things, we could bring them in. I also talked about having a larger board and commissions meeting, and that may also be an appropriate time that they could weigh in on just general thoughts on sustainability. If they have people willing to, to carry some water, great. I think we look, need to look at everything. Um, so we'll put that recently, as a ticker. I recently worked on they had a they had a big event at the high school about three weeks ago, the sustainability committee, and they had a presentation. I think they had three presenters and um, so I know they're very active and they, they've reached out to me on the maintenance side and said, you know, if you ever want to come or be involved, you know, we more than glad. So they have been reaching out to the school. Yeah. So when we're at a point that we're going to focus on this topic again, you have some legwork to do, right? I think that's what I'm hearing is you're going to yes. go out and get some additional data. Um, so when you come back, we'll, we'll, we'll include them as part of the conversation. So would it be helpful to be in communication with them while you're doing your component now, or would it be, be more beneficial for you to do your thing and then? It should, follow our, it should follow our work. So one more, I just wanted to thank Phil and his team again. Yeah. Part of the layout, I mean, we all obviously want to do this, do this once, do it right, and do what's best for the, the town and the kids, but 
what Phil was talking about, the daylight harvesting, just working in the last four years here with upgrading most of the buildings to the LED lights um, with the daylight harvesting, it's astronomical, the savings. So orienting the building the correct way with larger windows, the energy savings is, is through the roof there. So I just want to thank Phil for looking into that and doing that. We had about 25 minutes left, so I want to continue on, but unless others have comment on this issue. Um, we're, all right, three strict minutes, because uh, we're, we're running slight on time, so, but I'll let you have this one. I know it's a big topic for you, Bill. I think that um, the reason there's only 230 schools in, in the country and in Canada that have this uh, today is because this is a very new direction that Department, the U.S. Department of Energy and the global warming issue and everything else, this is new. This would be, if, if we did this in this high school, this would be the first high school, obviously, in the state of Rhode Island. It might be the first high school, well, anyway, it would be the first high school in the state of Rhode Island. We're a coastal community. To disregard, to, to make excuses and that we can't do this and disregard the fact that we're a coastal community that's going to be majorly affected at the as this, the rest of this century goes on with global warming, we're going to have, there, there's going to be a lot of uh, coastal properties in this town that will no longer be on our tax base. If we don't do this now and do it right, the people 20, 30, 50 years from now are going to go, what were we thinking? Now. Um, how, can you tell me how many of our f the five schools that we have left that'll be open after Wakefield closes in January? How many of those schools are um, are he are heated by natural gas? The only ones that aren't heated that are electric are Matunic and West Kingston. Those are electric. The other ones have natural gas. Okay, so I was at the school building subcommittee meeting on Monday and we got I got the, the latest data so the projected cost for uh, natural gas this year is three hundred and fifty thousand dollars electricity is seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a total of one point one million dollars now the high school I'm not saying that we should be zero but in, in my in my estimation, to not go the geothermal route for the heating and cooling of the building just makes no sense. Because if you do just that, you're not paying natural gas. You won't be paying natural gas costs for that school ever. And as time goes on, the cost of natural gas is what it's going to do. It's going to go up. So I, I think before you can make a, a definitive decision about whether or not you want to go this route, you really have to have a, uh, a, a chart that comes and shows you what you would actually save over the 50-year, whatever the how many years you think this building is going to be, the 50 years. Um, so all that, and, and I had... Uh, <clears throat> I, 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 gotta, had some, I gotta I know, move but you I had, along. I had some questions that I sent you in an email and I didn't get any responses and it had, they all had to do with this issue. Let's talk after the meeting if, if they were directed at me specifically. And no, I they, were, they were directed to the, to the committee, uh, to Mr. Conte. If it's communications to the committee, we don't respond to those emails. If we, if I bring them out as, community, as comment and if the, the committee decides they want to take it up, they can, but if it's, you know, at this point, what we share is open and in the public. 
Yeah, but we, you don't have to have flat roofs on, on the school. You could have pitched roof on cer certain Nor, portions. Of, I'm asking a question. You can ask, Mr. Conte, after the meeting, we need to keep our business moving. I uh, appreciate If you have pitched roofs on the school, certain portions of it, on the south-facing portions of the school, you can put solar shingles or solar panels on there without having them spread all over the place. Which you, you presented an email, which we received and I distributed to the committee. I have no problem with your comments. I'm just asking you keep it to the rules. All right, we'll move on. Um, Phil, you're back on stage. We'll move on to item seven. So status of stage two, preparation and affiliated tasks. So. Just asking at regular reports, how are you doing? Is there any hurdles that we need to clear as a committee? Uh, not at this time. We, we correspond as we need to with the administration, um, with information we may need, uh, radon reports, AHERA reports. Uh, so we're still progressing. Uh, certainly if I need anything, I will communicate to you directly if there's something that the board could help with. Uh, but at this time, we're we're progressing with our submission all right thanks uh if you, as always if you hit any hurdles let us know all right our review and discussion of owner's project manager rfq review and selection process so i have received an update um from raquel that it has been drafted it was forwarded to the town manager it's my understanding that it's been put out um with a expected due date jim what was it fifth which is Tomorrow, correct? Yeah. So the anticipation is that we'll receive those back. I have not spoken to the superintendent about this and, and what response has been received, but um, I will extend out a question on you know what has been received and then the steps moving forward. We had said that they were going to review as a committee. So my proposal was that next week's meeting, and I know I don't love to have meeting back to back, but we need to pick an OPM and we're behind schedule. So that meeting would be purely focused on OPM. Um, I don't know how others feel about that. I know, again, we don't love back to back meetings, but um, we did originally have that date scheduled for a meeting, which is I think the 11th. I say back to back, week to week. Not, we've been alternating weeks, so not necessarily back to back, but the 11th would be the meeting. The only topic would be OPM evaluation. Is there any uh, input on that or? I, I don't have a problem with doing the 11th. I just would, I respectfully request we could try to do it for four. I have a hard stop. Otherwise, I don't have to be here if, if other members of the school department are here, then. Do others have any conflicts at four? You can do four, 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 four. All right, so let's plan on four o'clock meeting. It's all business for the owner's project manager's um, evaluation and next steps. And that will be the only thing on the agenda. All right, perfect. Any other questions on that topic item for OPM? We'll be talking more next week. All right, moving on. Review and discussion regarding the uh, 300th anniversary parade. I did re receive an email today from Joanne Esposito from the 300th committee with a lot of the waivers and information. I haven't had ch time to wade through it, but I will. Um, but again, we will have to come up with our own display and our own trailer for this. So I'll put it out there that I don't personally have a trailer. I can look and see what we can use and I'll, I'll point to Jim on this um, as well. Or Brian, I don't know if your school department has a trailer that they could donate to the effort? Uh, we don't have a trailer. We usually work with the town highway department. Okay, so we obviously can, can look into that um, and also a truck to pull it, which I do have a truck. Well, I'm only glad to pull it, and I'm sure you do too. And it's electric. Have an electric truck. It's so electric will die in like two miles. <laughs> Although, come on. Probably. I have, I have the school department truck. Yeah. It's, not, it's not that pretty, but it's, uh, uh, it's that's school okay. department. It puts it on display. Um, all right, so let's chat to see what we can do. Yeah, we'll tow it the Mustang. Let's do that. Um, I, 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 um, we need to come up with the display, right? So we had talked about having a large image and maybe like some pop-outs to 3D. This is where I'm gonna kinda 
ask for some design support since you're so good. Um, but now that we have an image to pull from, you know, what does that board look like? It would be oversized, it would be large, obviously outside of your contract as far as printing and whatnot. But if you could assist maybe with some design graphics for that um, and how we maybe work some of the 3D aspects of that, um, it would be appreciated. So I'll follow up, but um, yeah, anyone who wants to is kind of on, the, on a side without a quorum, help with that would be appreciated because um, it's something that I think is important. We're going to want to have that on display. I would love to put that as, a, as an ask from official ask from the school building committee out to the public to see if someone has a, has a passion or a drive or a skill set because A, I have no skill set in this field and B, I have zero bandwidth, like none. I'm lucky I'm here right now. So I would hate to have, and I'm assuming you have zero bandwidth, you have zero bandwidth, you have zero bandwidth, you have zero bandwidth, so, oh well, I guess Mr. Manny will take it on, but, but no, seriously though, we, I would like to think that we would have, um, if we put out a request to look for, for volunteers to help. And that's something also, we can put it out, schools can put it out, a yep. lot of parents who might be able to assist. Um, and I also don't know if the CTE program can assist a little bit with some woodworking and things to prop this thing up. And make when it is the, remind the date? So it's June, I want to say it's 17th. Okay. Thank so you. It's, it's coming quick. So we'll have to, we'll have to definitely. Just have to make sure it's not like the uh, animal house float, you know. Right. It's gotta... we'll, we'll try to avoid that, Jim. Right, yeah. we'll do a tiny one. <laughs> All right, so anything else on that item? So I can put out something out that we're looking for volunteers and I'll also ask superintendent to put the word out. Look, the OPM date is May 8th, it's not the 5th. Okay, it's changed. all right, so that still puts us in fine shape to bring them on the 11th to start the initial evaluation. I don't expect to make any selections that day, it's to start looking through them, to find how we're going to approach this and essentially come out of the other end with so and and essentially set the interviews you know um, yeah okay it's all about you Dave <laughs> all right um, moving on uh, discussion of community showcase event schedule so. On the master schedule, and again, this was all preliminary at the time and, and kind of map out a logical way of going about the project, is on that we had a community showcase. The idea was that before everyone broke for summer, everyone off their merry way, Dave, um, that we would present out what we had for the project. We now have, and, and I think we're on track with that. We have an image of what we're proposing to the community. We have some concepts for athletic facility. We're starting down the road of looking at some of the core functions of the building. So the idea was to have a Saturday session to more informationally get the word out. This is what we're doing. This is where we're at. Um, we had it scheduled for the 13th, which is next week, next Saturday, week from Saturday. So I discussed this with Phil, and it's a little bit too short of a time frame. So, but I don't want to push it beyond too far beyond June because then everyone's going to go their merry way. So we discussed, what, the 20th is one option. And what was the other option? June. I think ideal for you was the 20th. Yeah. Okay. This is primarily Phil's show. It's to get information out to the community on where we're at and if people have questions to start the dialogue because this is part of the information campaign, right? Just getting the information out. So I don't expect that the committee will have much of a lift here. Those members who can attend, attend. I plan on attending. Um, does anyone have any objection to moving that date or have any input? No objection. Did we want to incorporate, um, I know we had talked about in the past, building tours with that? As in like Phil does, we has a presentation and then Anybody who would like to stay, tour the building, I know we had just discussed that, the current layout, because a lot of people don't know, you know, they've been in the gym, but they've never been in the calf or in the classrooms and or the boiler room. Um, 
I don't disagree that that's important. It would, it would just be harder to do like summer or the start of school because yeah. they're in the start of school. It's just like in September, everything's crazy for the first few weeks. It, it's it's tough. I know already our two hour meetings, which have been nine to eleven on this couple sessions that we've had, it's a lot to ask of people to come for two hours on a Saturday as it is. So my concern would be that by asking them to extend it with a tour, we can offer it, but I just don't want to be disappointed that we may not get a big pull. But we're in the high school, we can certainly offer a half hour or 20 minute tour to hit the hi highlights. If I would suggest we can, we can offer the tour at that point, but folks can coordinate with the district if they want tours. We have to be very careful with tours, because of course you want to make sure students aren't in, it's, it's about student safety if you have people going in and touring your building and you know, you want to know who's in your building, who's looking at your building, why are they in your building, what are they making note of about your building, you know. So I, I don't have a problem with tours, but I think that's something that should be coordinated with this, maybe the building principals. Mm. But I, um, I, to, your point, to your initial question, pushing the meeting off, it, it, absolutely push it off, because um, there's certainly not enough time. Um, I, I am curious about the timing, though. Um, I hear, I believe, I understand what you, you're saying, where we, it's like an update for the, for the community. Um, I just worry if it's a big plan, like the, going into spring and summer, the attendance, and we, we push a lot of updates out. So I just, I'm just curious of the timing. I would think we would want it closer actually to the fall rather than at this point, as far as doing a community showcase, I guess is my point. So this is the initial showcase, the kind of before the summer, but there's scheduled in some additional community showcases later. And we have like tangible stuff to Yeah, so I think present. Bill has mentioned, I'm gonna put him on the spot again, but model, things like that. That might be the time as we get closer to the bond mm. where questions are really gonna come up, right? And all of a sudden, September is gonna come and people are gonna start dialing in. Uh, for sure, and that, I think that's what I mean. I think like if we were doing it too soon, people aren't, I mean, they're paying attention, believe me, because I, I go to the supermarket with my hood up, like people are paying attention, and but they're not necessarily, they're just commenting more than digging. And so I just, I, I would, It'd be like, I feel like it'd be a little premature, but I could be wrong. I, someone else may have a different opinion on it. Uh, I mean, it's, I'll leave it to could the committee. Do it at like I, a school committee meeting or a town council meeting rather than having a Saturday showcase. I don't know. The, the idea behind it was really to just keep pushing information. You know, I think the one thing that's always in my mind is, and, and we're going to have a long lag over the summer. I don't expect to have much going on as far as community, too much community outreach in the summer because everyone kind of, with the kids and everything else, everyone dissipates, is to not be accused ever of not constantly pushing out good information. So if this helps that effort and it takes my time and Phil's time on a Saturday to do that, I'm more than glad to do it. Um, I always want to hang my hat on the fact that this process was very different than the previous and that we've done everything we could to get good information out. And if people don't come, shame on them. Um, but we will have many more opportunities for the public to engage as we get nearer. And, and I expect the, the product to continually get better. This one, the product's gonna be some image, pretty much an enhancement of what we've seen tonight. I don't expect much more. So, so if no one has an objection, I'm more than glad to do my time and Phil's time. The committee really doesn't, and I'm not saying this to, to push you out, but I know we all have obligations. You know, it's the Studio Jade show, really. All right, anything else on that topic? Good? All right, so we'll plan on the 20th, we'll do the information event, and really, if it, we don't have to do two hours. It could be legitimately an hour for this one. I think shorter the better. All right. Yeah, I, think, I think the point is, for <clears throat> This is not in lieu of something in the fall. This is an addition to something in the fall. It's extra. The more that we can do, the better. That's not my comment. But I'll yeah. <laughs> my wife loves it when I'm gone. That's fine. Um, all right. On to item number 11, general public comment. I am going to limit general uh, public comment tonight because I've allowed public comment after each item. 
So, and we're at 655, another meeting is coming in, so I am going to forego that. However, if there's questions of Phil, of public members of the public after this meeting, you can corner them and ask any questions you'd like. Um, scheduling of next meeting, so we have a meeting for next week, which is the 11th at four o'clock, dealing only with OPM. Any questions, comments, concerns on that? No? All right, then with that I'll, before you adjourn, adjourn, I would like to volunteer my services as secretary going forward so that we have a consistent human doing the notes. And I will do what I need to do to make sure that uh, minutes are submitted on time. If you would like me. I will thank you. I will second like that. Me. I'm just a <laughs> oh, Actually, thank I need you. a nomination and I need a second. I will nominate Katie for a second. We have a nomination for Katie. Is there a second? A second, second times oh. a thousand. <laughs> Over everybody. Ryan, second it. <laughs> and how okay. do you like your coffee? No, that's a joke. <laughs> are there any? Are there any other nominations on the floor? I'm gonna guess not. So with that, I'll I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All in favor? Welcome, Madam Secretary. Thank you. Thank you for stepping up. We appreciate. As you can hear, we appreciate it. All right. With that, I'll call a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Brian. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you, Kate. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It is 657. Thank you very much. Thank you.